presence. There is joy beyond all measure. And at his precious feet, peace of mind. heard. We're leaving these up here today for the rest of the weekend to remind us where God can bring us from. The pit to the palace. The pit to the palace. God only wants the best for his children. You'd see that Miss Eva gets that back. I think she'd want it. I'd like to ask um, Shauna Cooper Craigmile and Cindy Cooper, Miller Cooper, to come to the platform, and I'm, um, I, we're very honored today to have them both, um, mother and daughter, you can have a seat, uh, share some testimony with you of a different type, and um, our family has suffered through the past three years, if you know our families, tragedies and tragedies and some more tragedies. And look here, we're still standing. We have smiles today. God will bring you through. So this is a two-part thing. It's going to be a little lengthy. If you have to go, go quietly. But I hope you stay and listen to what God has done here. Good morning. This is um, my home church for those of you who don't know me. Um, I was raised here. My mom was the youth pastor when um, my brother and I were coming up when we were the youth. So my mom was the mom to, to everybody in the church. So a lot of good friends, good memories. Um, my testimony is a little bit different than what we just heard. But wow, did that bless my soul. Isn't that what God does? Isn't that what our Lord does? That he takes you from the pit. And brings you to the palace. And I, I was sitting there while she was talking. And I thought, wow, our stories are so different. And how we were raised, Aunt Sue, was so different. But oh my goodness, and brokenness. Brokenness is the same. 
whether you're in the palace or whether you're in the pit. And when she, a lot of things that I, I heard last night and I've heard this morning, and, and when you were saying it's surrender. And as I go through my testimony, when I begin to change and when I begin to get better is when I finally surrendered. Lord, I give it to you. I give you my brokenness. So I wanted to read the scripture. It's in Psalms 34 and 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such as a contrite spirit. And contrite, as Aunt Sue said last night, means crushed. And I would say that I felt crushed and very broken. In September of 2016, I miscarried what would have been my third child. And on November 22nd of 2016, my husband of 14 years took his life. And I became part of an elite club that I never wanted to be part of, a survivor of suicide loss. And suicide is the 12th leading, and this, the statistics are from 2020, but it was um, the 12th leading cause of death was 45,975 Americans died by suicide. The year my husband died, it was like 36,000. Do you see that trend? That number is going up. We have what the world needs. But as she was saying, when she came into the church, there wasn't, everybody loved on her and they loved that. I could have been this statistic because after my husband took his life, there were days I thought, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I was so broken and so overwhelmed. I felt devastated by the sudden violent death, ashamed, embarrassed, guilty, abandoned, rejected, and boy, did I experience anger. And I felt worthless. Thank you. The suicide took place two days before Thanksgiving. And I had been a stay-at-home mom for eight years up to that point. I really wasn't sure how I was going to keep a roof over my daughter's heads or food on the table. But I learned that God was my provider. He was my Jehovah Jireh. Unlike you, I grew up in church my whole life. My parents were ministers. They've been missionaries. And you hear that God is your provider. But until you actually get to experience him in that way, do you really know for yourself I found out that God was my provider. Christmas was just around the corner. God provided our every need. I never had to ask for a penny. My parents paid the portion of the funeral that the military didn't until I can pay them back. And I didn't even have to ask. I was in my room. I was on my knees. I was like, God, I don't even know how I'm going to pay these bills. My mom and dad came and said, we know you don't have it. Here it is. We know you'll pay us back. Then my in-laws at the time, they came and said, we want to pay your parents back. I share this with you not to make you feel sorry for me, but for you to understand that he can be your Jehovah Jireh, that he is your provider. If you haven't found yourself in a desperate place, you haven't been broken. I hope you make it out of this life into heaven without feeling that. But I want you to remember that there was a girl that talked about her husband taking his life. And she didn't know how she was going to make it. But God provided her every need. I came today to tell you how big my God is. That he's a miracle worker. That he's a way maker. When you don't know where your food's coming from, he'll provide your food for you. Ooh. Ooh. Our church family here, this is where my daughters and I attended church. They cook, they pray, they took my daughters on outings. I don't know, there was months there. My kids were coming and going. 
from the church people, people, my parents, the church. And then I was sitting home by myself like, what do I do now? My kids are not here. What do I do? How do I fill my time? You all showed us love. You prayed with us. You visited us. Some of you stopped by just to give hugs because there's no words at a time like that. You provided us meals, groceries. Months later, friends still came by. I went leave small gifts for my daughters and, uh, to encourage us. That helped us to know that we weren't alone. I can't tell you the phone calls, the cards, the texts, the emails, the letters, the Facebook messages that I received during this time. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. The outpouring of love was more than we could have ever imagined or asked for. Pastor Tom met me at UC Hospital that night, along with other church friends and family. After the girl's dad uh, shot himself, he lived almost four hours. So my family and friends that gathered with me watched as I watched him take his last breath. <laughs> Pastor gently guided me that night when it was time to leave and ask what he could do to help. In the days to come, Pastor Tom, you supported me through prayer, understanding, visiting our home, preaching the funeral, dealing with family meetings that were absolutely uncomfortable but necessary. So sincerely, six years later, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Thank you to the church. I know that I, 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 there was people praying for me that I didn't even know, people from other churches, other states, everywhere, and we needed every bit of it at that time in our life. Go easy on your pastors because you may not always know what they're dealing with because death is heavy. On May 21st of 2017, yes, six months later, Logan Cooper, my handsome 19 year old nephew was hit in a hit and run accident and he died. Now this time we were devastated again, but this time my daughters and I had to be the one strong for my brother, his other son and my parents. But one thing I know for sure is God is faithful. In Hebrew, El Shaddai means he is the all-sufficient one. He is God Almighty. So I'm going to break it down in terms that we understand today. It's a little bit easier, maybe a little bit more Kentuckian for us. I like to say it like this. He is the God of more than enough. <laughs> Nothing is impossible for God. He's the God of the impossible. He is the more sufficient. Uh, he is more than sufficient to meet any need you may have. He overcomes our inadequacies. He's faithful and he keeps his promises. There were some things that I uh, people say. Well, what did you do? Well, we went to counseling. I took every bit of advice that a pastor gave it to me. Some pastors that lived in other states would call and. I grew up around pastors and missionaries my whole life, and I thought that was normal until I got out in the world, and then you realize not everybody has that. God was so good to me. Every day it was like, here's your morsel to get you through today. Here's another morsel to get you through. Here's another one. I had people uh, calling me that I worked for 15 years ago, and they said, we don't care what you need. You need money? Do you need food? Do you need a job? What We don't care what you tell that girl. We don't care what she needs. I hadn't seen him in 15 years. When you live a life that honors God, it comes back around. We don't always think of it that way, but it did. I told my, my best friend that still worked there, I said, tell him I don't need anything but just prayers. And then I started thinking, wow, I, I, got, a, I got a lot to contend with and and, and figure out, and I'm going to need some guidance, and this is what they do. I worked for an accounting firm, and 
They help people with financial planning. So I called back and said, hey, I'm going to need some help. And she said, okay. And she said she went to pray. Because some of the people that were there were people, you know, 15 years, people come and go. There was a gentleman there that was a Christian. And some of the older people that were there that were my friends wanted to be the ones to help me. And my girlfriend said, I started praying that it would be this certain individual that would call you. And he called me one day. And he said, uh, hi, you know, my name's George. Um, They asked me to give you a call. I know this is an awkward time for you. And he kept talking to me like that. And finally he said, listen, I'm a Christian. He said, and me and my wife have been praying for you. You're going to make it. Your life isn't over. God told me to tell you the best is yet to come. This is what we've been praying for you. This is what we're believing for. That was my morsel for that day. We did counseling. Um, my daughters hated it. I didn't like it either. It was my worst nightmare, Your, you know, my worst fear. It's exactly like you see on TV. It was a small group. Your knees almost touched strangers. I didn't even want to be around people I knew, let alone go be in a room full of stra- you know, strangers. And, uh, but it, it was, we would learn something when we went each time. And we come out and the girls say, why do you make us come to this? I drag them in the car. Why are you doing this to us? I'd say, I don't know. It's what they say needed, what we all need to do. Shut up and get in the car. <laughs> they, the whole, they complained the whole car ride there. I'm telling you, there wasn't a place that we could go to here. It was a far drive. They complained the whole way. I was like, oh, we would get there. And I was thinking, I don't want to do this either. And they said, are you going to keep making us do this? How long we got to do this? It's so weird. Well, I said, oh, here, here we go. You're going to go in a class, you're going to go in a class, and I'm going to go in a class. And if one of us learns something to teach the other one to crawl out of this hole that we're in, by golly gee, we're coming back next week. They would come out, they'd get in the car, and they'd say, what did you learn? We'd all share, and I'd say, okay, now we're headed for ice cream. But if you ask my two girls now, they say it's the best thing you could have ever done for us. Get help. If you need help, get help. Find a Christian counselor. Don't walk around with that pride and stigma that, that, that you can figure it out and you got it. We just heard our sister say here, she was a counselor herself. I was talking to her at the bathroom break. Right there she is. You need help afterwards, hunt her down. She'll find you somebody to talk to. Get help. Don't let the enemy, he's been loose on the earth. We're living in the last days. Don't you waste your time letting the enemy come to your mind telling you you can't make it. I'm standing here today. Eva was standing here today. We're saying, yes, you can. Where's the sister that talked about being in jail? We talked, well, right there she is. Hey, she made it. She was incarcerated. She loves God. God's working, worked everything out for her. You think he can't do the same for you? Well, I'm here to tell you, yes, he can. The battle is in your mind. It's in your mind. I got up every day. We went to counseling one night. It was Valentine's Day. Uh, It's a little group counseling that I hated every time we went. It was, it was uncomfortable. But I learned something every time we went. And I learned to just walk in there and say, okay, I'm here to learn what they're going to teach me tonight. They put me in a group with this man one night. We had to answer questions. We never did that before. And by the end of the class, I had everybody laughing. A room full of people who lost their spouses. And by the end of the night, they were cracking up, okay? I don't know how God does it, but he does, right? We had to ask each other questions. Super awkward. I love sharing things with strangers. I'm the most private person. Getting up in front of people is not my thing. God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? We went through these questions. He was a little bit further on in his grief journey than me. And uh, I said, okay, uh, you want to ask me or you want to, who, who's going to do this thing? And so we laughed and we talked and we started asking each other the questions. And one of the questions was like, when does it get better? And I was like, heck if I know, I wish somebody would tell me. <laughs> that was my answer to him, right? 
I know it's coming. I don't know when it's coming. I wish it was today. And he said he went on vacation. I was like, shut the front door. You got better after that? He said, I'm telling you, it just felt good. You know, watch the, I said, I've got one planned. I can't wait. Me and my girls went on a cruise with uh, Vicki Unthank, who has went on to meet the Lord. We were uh, very good friends. She walked this journey out with me. So when she passed on, I felt that. She was a, a good woman, and she would be here today, sitting on the front pew, I do believe. God allows uh, things to happen. I don't think God causes things like this to happen, but we live in a fallen world. So in 2 Corinthians, I went to the Word of God, and that's where I begin to stand on Pastor Tom, when I begin to, to get better. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, casting down vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Whoo, I still do that one. I still get up weekly and I say, oh, not today, Satan. It got better. It used to be an everyday battle for me from the time I got up. It's a choice. I'm getting better. My kids are going to get better. They're watching me. I'm going to do the right thing. One day I'm not going to be here. I'm not a runner. I hate to run. I never like to run. But you're trying to get away from where you are, right? If I could have strapped my kids on my back and ran through glass or crawled, and somebody would have told me that would have made me better, right? Like, you can get better today. I would have done it. I would have done anything. But I also knew it was a process. I didn't like that. One day I went out and I ran four and a half miles and I never stopped. I'm not a runner, people. And I'm not young either. I'm not going to tell you how old I am. My mom will if you ask her. I went out and I could just run and run and run, you know, trying, trying to get away from where you were grateful. I begin to say, girls, we're going to find something today that we're grateful for. And they're like, like grumbling in the car, you know, and we would pull up and uh, somebody paid for our meal. You know how they do that? Like pay for your meal. And I'm like, look right there. It is. There's our nugget today. They're like, really mom. I'm like, really girls. We're going to say, thank you, Jesus. Somebody just paid for our meal. That's where we are. When you're at rock bottom, you better find anything you can find to get better. Because Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's coming for your mind. He's coming for your thoughts. Right? If you're not prayed up, if you're not read up, if you're not quoting those scriptures back, whoa, wait a minute, I cast down that thought. Nope, I'm the daughter of the Most High King. Oh, I may be here right now, but I'm climbing out of the pit that I'm in. Right? We came home from counseling one night. I didn't cry a lot when their dad died. I think I was so overwhelmed. And my mom kept saying, the tears are coming. I was like, no, they're not. I was angry. I was mad. She said, those tears are coming. And when they do, they're not going to stop. I didn't want to hear that. This, This wasn't all pretty. And I'm not here to tell you that... Is all in a pretty box and a pretty bow, and our family did it gracefully every day. We did not. We came home from counseling one night. My daughters asked me to share this story because I'm telling on myself. They asked me on the way to church to tell this one. We came home, and uh, Ashlyn had so much fear. I could not go to the restroom by myself. They hung on me. And she looked at me and she said, I can't come in this house. She called the, I think she called the church people. She might not have. (laughs) I think she had Mandy and Mark's number like on speed dial. Come get me. I can't stay here. Because uh, it reminded her of her dad. It was sad in our home. That grief and that cloud was there. And we all wanted to get away from it. That night she looked at me and she was hysterical. And when you're already trying to hold it together, right? And you're trying to already hold them together. And then she's falling apart. I had had all I could stand. We had just came back from counseling. Love that place. Big old thing of Mountain Dew because I like Mountain Dew. It made me happy. 
She looked at me and said, I'm calling grandma. I can't stay here. <sighs> and I just melted down. I, I thought, I can't deal with this. I can't do this. My kids don't even want to come home. I didn't do anything. I'm still here. I'm still going to church. I grew up in church. I didn't do anything to cause this. What in the world? I picked up that blessed Mountain Dew and I threw it across my house. It hit the cabinets. It went all over the kitchen floor. I said, the devil wins. I can't do it anymore. My daughter that was seven years old, raise your hand, Mariah, at the time. She said, that's enough. The devil doesn't win in this house. She said, you get over here and sit down, the two of you. We listened to what she said. She said, I'm going to pray over you. The devil doesn't win in this house today or ever. She started speaking in tongues. God is for you. I don't know who you are. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know your details. I've got more details, but some things I'm just not ready to share just yet. I don't know your details, but God does. If God can, if people from church, we came back to church, we went to a ladies thing and we were at church here another time and people would come get me and drag me to Mariah. She's speaking in tongues. I'm like, she's been doing that for a couple of years now. <laughs> I really didn't want to tell that story on myself. But if God can move on a seven-year-old speaking in tongues, saying, hey, wait a minute, when mom was breaking down, not taking captive those thoughts, tell me he doesn't love you. Tell me he doesn't care about you. I don't believe it. Has everything worked out in my life perfectly? No. Is it all still pretty? No. There's days we still cry, don't we, girls? There's days we still get sad. There's other things that come up in life that are still overwhelming, right? But this one thing I know, I serve the God who is more than enough. I don't care how dark it looks for you. I don't care what they just said to you. I don't care what the haters say. I don't care how many times you've messed up. I don't care how many times you've overdosed. I don't care how many times you thought about not being here. Come on. At bathroom break, we were talking about that, weren't we? Christians struggle too. No matter what happens, it isn't over. I don't care what the verdict says. Oh, my sister, we talked at bathroom break. <laughs> I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care if you've been divorced multiple times. I don't care if you have a degree. I don't care if you don't have a degree. I don't care. It isn't over. As long as there is breath in you, it isn't over. You woke up this morning. God isn't through with you. It isn't over. Your best life is in front of you. Don't you dare give up and don't you dare give in. You take captive those thoughts. I don't know this is for somebody this morning. I've been praying since January that God, whoever's there, God, you bring the right people. Because I believe this has been my prayer. This is hell and this is Satan, uh, uh, God's, God's hand trying to hold you out of hell. And my prayer has been, God, snatch them. Snatch them back out. There's somebody that, that you feel like it's too late. It's over. It isn't over. As long as there's breath, you still have a choice. Surrender is the answer. Who do you surrender to? God. I can't do it anymore. God, I can't do it on my own. God, I need you to rescue me in my situation. When he hears that, do I have a witness that he comes running? Oh, he shoved I. He called up but I he said.
You got to do something. You've got to make up your mind. You got to say not today. I begin to see things a little differently. We had a lot of loss in our family. The night of my nephew's funeral, my uncle passed away. Like another one. And then another one. And then another one. And I believe in being real. I just tell it all like it is. I hope that's okay. I couldn't even come to a funeral. It took about everything I could do to get myself together to come to a funeral. There was people who who lost children that I adore in this church. And I got outside and it was like I was having PTSD and it was all coming back. And I went home. What I've learned is the only way through that is to get yourself out of the car, march yourself right on down here. I don't know why it was overwhelming to me, but it was. When I say I'm still a work in progress and God's still healing me, God's still healing me. But I'm not where I was. I'm not going back there. I set my my eyes on, on the hills from which cometh my help and my help cometh from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He placed the stars. He hung the moon. Oh, I begin to say that this world doesn't matter. She was, Eva was saying these kind of things don't matter. Those kind of things don't matter. I begin to realize this world, Aunt Sue, is not my home. I'm only passing through. Oh, when you get to that place (laughs) and you begin to read in God's word, you can't hold on to unforgiveness. You got to let it go. Somebody in here today needs to hear that. Is it worth it? Is what you're holding on to worth it? I'm sorry they hurt you. I'm sorry they talked about you. I'm sorry your situation was unfair. But ask yourself this. Is it worth missing heaven? That puts a lot of things in perspective. That'll make you lay lay down a lot of things, right? My daughters and I are growing, learning, and reaching for high things. My daughters love Jesus. I'm remarried. We live on a farm. If you know me, that's hysterical in itself. I did not grow up on a farm. I do farm things now. I like to wear shoes like this every day. I work in a furniture store, but we live on the farm, and my husband will come say, come on, come with me. And then I'm like out in mud and dirt. I'm like, could you not have told me to change my shoes? Like, you're on a farm. What'd you expect? Come on, we got to get this done. God has a sense of humor. I have a dog. If you know me, that's hysterical. A cat. And I fed an orphan deer. And he thought I was his mother. (laughs) He would knock on my door and yell, And I was like, there's the boy I never got to have. (laughs) My daughters were like, you love him. I'm like, I do. He's so cute, isn't he? (laughs) My dad came to stay with me about a month ago. And my dad's like, the dog's there. The cat's there. And here comes the baby's ear running up to his mommy. (laughs) I said, dad, do you want to feed him? Just like he fed my daughter's. He's sitting out there with a baby bottle like, uh. And I looked at my dad and I said, do you see why I feel like I'm Snow White now? He's like, yeah, yeah, I do. God has a sense of humor. We have a future. The best is yet to come. When I'm saying this, we, I'm not just saying this, me and my girls, I mean all of us. 
We aren't surviving, we're thriving. We aren't statistics. I'm not perfect, but I'm loved by Jesus. I'm not lost and without hope. I'm not a drug addict and I'm not an alcoholic, but I am a child of God. I'm the daughter of the Most High King. I am happy and I am healing. We serve the God of more than enough. Yes, I've been broken, but I'm blessed. And you may be sitting there saying, that's great for you. I felt that way. That's not where you find yourself right now. Maybe you're not rejoicing today, but you're broken. You're not sure how all the pieces are going to come together. Here is the most awesome thing I can tell you. It don't matter if you know how it's going to come together. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's my healer. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's my banner. He's my protector. He's proven to be my Jehovah Jireh. There's many, many other names of God. Through these years, I've learned. And and I, I just recently called my mom one day. And I said, I was finally able to say, thank you, God. Thank you for my tragedy. Because it cast me into your arms. Spent a lot of time in the bathroom at my house. That's where I like to pray. My husband says, what are you doing in there? You're in there forever. I said, look, if you wanted to marry somebody that looks like you, you would have. You didn't. It takes a long time. What can I say? (laughs) But I also tell him I'm in there praying. That's where I pray and that's where I read. I came here today to tell you that there is hope. When you feel hopeless, there is hope. When you feel broken, crushed, You don't see a way out. You don't know how it's going to work out. He's there. I'm going to let my mom come. I don't want to take up too much time. There's something we all have in common. We all have a date that we were born. And we all are appointed a day that we'll die. But my question to you ladies today is, what are you going to do with a dash in between? My daughters and I, after we came home from that night and I threw the drink all over and we went back to counseling and I knew they were, they were going to tell on me. They were going to tell their counselor what I did, which meant I had to tell my counselor what I did. And I thought, oh my Lord, these people are going to think I'm nuts and they're going to take my kids away. I said, well, I need to tell you something. I lost it the other night. I threw the drink across the room and it went everywhere. And they were like, that's so good. Like, what is wrong with you people? And why do they keep telling me to come to you? She said, oh, you're showing your daughter, Shauna, that it isn't always pretty. And life isn't always easy. And if you don't show them your struggle as you're going through it, they're going to think when they hit rough places in life, wow, I'm doing something wrong. I don't want to be here anymore. I said, well, I'm doing a good job then. There is hope for a hopeless world, and God is more than enough. Before I minister this morning, I would like for Sister Nora Trent to stand up. She's all the way in the back. This is my mother in the Lord. She's my confidant, my counselor. When I need to be rebuked, she rebukes me. But I am so thankful for her presence in my life and the influence that she's been. And I just wanted to honor her this morning before we went any any further. Will you give my mother in the Lord a hand? Two things I need to say. If I have learned anything through my brokenness 
and through my painful experiences in life, it is this, that there are hurting people all around us every day. It's not just me. It's not just Shauna, but there are hurting people everywhere. After Logan died, so many people from this church came up to me and began to share the losses in their life. And one very unassuming couple in this church, Ron and Yvonne Mahan, they came up to me and they said, Sister Cindy, we lost a grandson too. I, I never knew. Our church is big and, and you don't hear everything and you, don't, you aren't privy to, to every situation. But it, my, my brokenness made me acutely aware that there are hurting people around us every day. And we need to open our eyes and, and be very aware of that. The second thing I want to say before I even get started this morning is, I'm not going to stand here this morning and give you a sad story. Because I am blessed. And until the last breath leaves my body... I'll still be praising him. Psalm 147.3 says, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. The word broken means to burst or to break into pieces. And the word bindeth means to bandage up. This scripture is not talking about a little cut or a bruise. It's not talking about, oh, I didn't get the house I put a bid in for. Or, they passed me over for the promotion. It's, it's not talking about, I have a bad headache or I ran out of gas on the way to work this morning. But this scripture is talking about that situation that exploded in your life. Unexpected, unwanted, the situation that did collateral damage. You see, the pottery doesn't have just a little crack. It has been shattered into a million pieces. But the great physician knows what to do. And with his gentle hand and his eyes full of love, he begins to take our broken hearts and to bandage them and to put us back together again. Back in the 90s, they sang this song that says, Gentle hands, if you know it, sing it with me, holding on to me. Gentle hands, guiding me so carefully. Though they lead me down through paths, I won't always understand. Though they lead me down through paths, I won't always understand. Though they lead me down through paths, I won't always understand. I will have no fear, for I'm in gentle hands. My pastor's wife, many years ago, Rhoda Webb, said to me, Cindy, God is the healer of broken hearts, and he can heal anything that is broken, but you have to give him all the pieces. You see, that's what we sometimes do, ladies. In our brokenness, we give him most of the pieces. But there are sometimes a few things that we, we hold back. And when we do that, he can't completely heal you. I believe that God has brought some very special people to this place this weekend to experience complete and total healing. It's time to give him the pieces that you've been holding on to. The Lord took me to Psalm 42. 
that starts by saying, As the heart pants after the water brook, so panteth my soul after you, O God. My Bible says this is the fourth song of instruction in the time of distress. This was a special psalm that they used to teach the people how to get through hard times. I think we we read it sometimes and think David had such a desire for God. Oh, that's wonderful. I want to have that too. But there's a different connotation here. You see, the, the enemy of David's soul was at work once again. One thing for sure, he was a man desperately seeking God. And so he speaks and says, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my heart after thee, O God. This was probably penned by David when Absalom, his son, was trying to uh, overthrow him as king and take over. Can you imagine the brokenness and the hurt that David felt? And maybe he penned it as the, de- the Bible says when he was walking up the hill having to flee from the palace because Absalom was coming. And the word of God said David was walking up the hill barefoot and weeping. He was in a place of great brokenness. But I want you to understand what this chapter is talking about. It talks about the heart or the deer. You see, the heart does not sweat. So when the enemy begins to chase the heart, he, he, it's very easy for him to get overheated and faint. So what does he do? He heads for the water. And he will get in that water and stay submerged as long as he can hold his breath. When he can no longer hold his breath, they said the deer will stick just his nose out of the water. So he can breathe and stay hidden from the enemy. You know, the heart knew where to run in the time of trouble. We've got to know where to run, ladies, when we are broken into a million pieces. Psalm 27, David said, One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of praise. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. As you begin to delve into Psalm 42, you begin to realize immediately that David is conflicted. In one breath, his faith seems strong and secure. But in the next breath, it's evident that the struggle is real. His emotions are raw. And we hear David say things like, My tears have been my meat night and day, while they continually say to me, Where is thy God? I had a, a, one of my neighbors, and, and we love each other. We're very close neighbors. We take care of each other. But when all of these tragedies begin to happen, and they were here, they attended the services, My friend said to one of the other neighbors, look at them. They say they're Christians and they pray and they go to church and all these bad things happen to them. Oh, but they don't know that even though I was in great brokenness, I wasn't there alone. He was there right beside me. David said, why are thou cast down on my soul and why are thou dis- 
disquieted within me. The word cast down means to be in despair. And the word disquieted means, are you ready? To murmur, to growl, to roar, to cry aloud, to mourn, to rage, to make noise, to be loud. It means when you take the glass of Mountain Dew and throw it across the room. That's what it's talking about here, ladies. But I want you to know something. Even in those weak moments when we are broken, God is not intimidated. I heard at the wagers, one of my champions say one time, God does not hold you responsible for the things that you say when you're under pressure. When Logan was playing football, I was at a football game one night and I got up to go, go somewhere and I fell. And my whole f- side of my face hit the concrete. I saw stars. And they all came running and they wanted to take me to the hospital. You know, when you, you hit your head hard, you become disoriented. And it takes you a few minutes to get your bearings and, and calm down. It's no different when we go through those breaking times, when we are broken and those things come out of nowhere over which we have control. Sometimes it takes us a minute to calm down and get ourselves back under control. But I think I need to say to someone, the enemy has put so much guilt on you because of the things you've said under pressure and maybe because you threw them out and do. But God has not been intimidated by that. He knows your heart. <laughs> Clearly, David is in a great struggle. The word of God says he was a man after God's own heart. I believe David was one of the most nostalgic characters in the Bible. He's always thinking about the past. And I believe as he was penning Psalm 42, he began to think about things that had taken place over the years. I believe that he struggled as he began to remember some of the things that happened. I believe he he started thinking about the 17 times that King Saul sought his life. 17 times. But then he remembered. But the last time, my friend Jonathan warned me and I was able to escape. Praise be to God. I believe David, probably as he penned this psalm, remembered when he was fleeing for his life from Saul, how he went to Nob and in the presence of the priest, he takes Goliath's sword, he lies to the priest, lies to the priest, and eats the hallowed showbread. And right after that, I believe David was remembering that he went down to Gath, And was trying to hide there. And people were saying, don't you know who that man is? That's the champion of Israel. And David begins to act like a crazy man. The Bible said he began to claw at the gate and let spit come down on his beard. Not one of his better moments. David began to realize how he had failed and how he, how he had even sinned as he was pinning this song. I believe he remembers how God sent him. He was all by himself, but then little by little, God be, began to gather a, an army of men who would usher him to the throne. And he began to remember what the Bible calls the mighty men. I believe he began to remember Ziklag, when, when David was, he was once again in Gath, he shouldn't have been there. But uh, the enemy came while they were gone and took the women and the children and everything they had. And he remembered 
that the same men who loved him wanted to put him to death because of Ziklag. But then I believe David said, but wait a minute. I sought the Lord. He said, Lord, shall I pursue or not pursue? And God answered and said, pursue. And they got back everything that they had lost. I believe as David began to remember the good things of the Lord, it's when he said, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me. And my prayer shall be unto the God of my life. Then in verse 9 he says, Why have you forgotten me, God? Do you see the pattern? He struggled. God wants someone here to understand that you have struggled with some things in life. That you have not understood and it has left you broken. But God loves you and he's not going to leave you in your brokenness alone. Nor does he keep condemnation on you. It's time to lay that guilt and condemnation at the foot of the cross before you leave here this weekend. The other night I sat straight up in the bed and the Holy Spirit spoke one word to me. Buffeted. I know what that means, Latoya. Get up. God's trying to tell you something. The word buffet means to strike with the fist or to give a blow with the fist. It means to treat with violence and insulting language. Ladies, some of you have been experiencing this. The enemy of your soul has buffeted you. He has come. He has beat you up and you've allowed him to do it. He has has spoken into your life things untruths and made you believe it. But we're going to see God make a change in that. Now I'm going to give my testimony. Shauna talked about Greg's demise a couple of days before he died I had a dream I dreamed we were in a women's conference in this church and all of a sudden we realized that there was a horrible storm outside and every woman ran to a window and they were looking out and the sky was as black as it could be and there were tornadoes everywhere On every side of the church, the lightning and the thunder was hot green or lime green and hot pink in my dream. I dream in color, living color. The storm was bad. And every woman was filled with fear. In my dream, Sid Renfro stood up and she said, Girls, We'll be okay if we just stay in the house. It was probably two days. We were all gathered at my house having Logan's 19th birthday celebration. When we got the news of what had happened. I want to say about my son-in-law. He was the greatest guy you'd ever meet in your life. People loved him. The day of his funeral, Pastor Tom can attest to this. There were 40 commissioned officers who sat right here in this section during his services. Pastor Tom said, Cindy, we've had big funerals, but nothing like this. They're they're, uh, uh, around the church gathered trying to get in. And I also want to say how much I appreciate As Shauna said, this church, the people of this church, and Tommy Bates, he walked through through that with us. He didn't leave us for a moment, but he was right there. And as she said, 
he died in November. Christmas was coming. And one day there was a knock on the door and we opened the door and it was Trey Bates and Ashley. They brought a Christmas tree and they set it up in that living room. We will never forget that as long as we live. Those are the things, the memories that you remember that help get you through. I'm so grateful and so thankful for that. The days that followed his death were long and dark. Shauna said she didn't know where her provision would come from. If you want to put up that picture of them at that time. I watched her. She said, what do I tell my girls? I didn't know what to tell her. So, you know, I said, just tell them as little as you can. So she told them their dad had died and we didn't tell them how. But Shauna had to go to the doctor. She never went on a nerve pill, never had any of that, but... She saw her doctor and he said, Shauna, what did you tell your children? And she told him she didn't tell them what had happened. And he said, you go home, you have to tell them. If you don't tell them, they will hear and they'll never trust you. You go home and tell them. And I remember sitting there as she came home. We'd already seen them cry one time just knowing that their dad had died. But she sat there and told them how he had died. And I, you should never have to see a child grieve. But those girls' moans came out of them like I have never heard and never want to hear again. The grieving of children understanding and knowing how their father had died. I don't know how we made it through those days, but God. I can't tell you that I came to church one night and somebody slapped hands on me and it was all over. All I can tell you is that it was grace every day. The grace of God was sufficient to see us through every day. And then on May 21st, 2017... We moved in with Shauna, left our home and moved in with her. This is almost six months later and we're still there. On Sunday morning, I got up. I'm always up before any of them. I get up very early. I'd gone downstairs and was getting ready to get ready for church and poured myself a cup of coffee and my phone rang. And I knew in my spirit that it was one of those calls you don't want to answer. I picked the phone up, and it was my son. I only have two children, Shauna and Tony. And it was my son, and he was crying hysterically. I couldn't even understand what the boy was saying. But finally, I heard him say, Mom, Logan is dead. We got up immediately, threw clothes on, and went back to my house. That day, as soon as church was over, Pastor Tom came and joined us there and stayed with us. He was a victim of hit and run. His car had broken down. He had been out with his girlfriend. They had a fight. And she took his phone. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a phone. So he started walking home on 25 down in Grant County. You all know what that means. There are no lights. It was rainy. It was dark. And he was the victim of hit and run. For the days that, that followed that, after the funeral, my prayer to God was this. God, I just need to know that Logan made it. I prayed for those boys every time I prayed. They went through a, a bitter divorce with their parents. Bitter And they were more like my sons than my grandsons. If they wanted to know something, they would ask me instead of asking their mom or dad. I'm talking about those questions. I loved them like my son, like my sons. And uh, my only concern was I've got to know God. A couple of weeks before the tragedy happened, 
They were there. We were eating breakfast. And I said, Logan, you got to pray. He said, Grandma, I do pray. He said, I believe. And I'm so glad that I heard those words. But after he died, I, I had to know. I had to have something. And one day, a friend of mine, a pastor in San Antonio called, or Austin, he said, Sister Cindy, I was praying in the church, and I heard the audible voice of God say, you call her and tell her she has one more reason to go to heaven. I appreciate that. But it didn't satisfy my heart. A few days later, a pastor's wife from San Antonio, like my daughter, called. I had shared with her, Cecilia, I can't stand to think that Logan laid on the side of a road and died by himself. She prayed, and several days later, she called me back. She said, Cindy, I was praying, and the Lord said to call you and tell you, he was not alone. I sent my angels to watch over him. That still didn't satisfy. I had to know that I knew I was praying every day. The ladies retreat in Gatlinburg came up and they begged me to go, but I just couldn't. I just couldn't go. Sid Renfro was the speaker. Some of you ladies were there. You know what I'm going to say. They had the Saturday night service and Sue called and she said, Cindy, when we get back to the, ha to the cabin, Sid wants to call you. She, she needs to talk to you. And I said, okay. So Sid Renfro called me on the phone and she said, Cindy, I didn't hear about your grandson until 24 hours after the tragedy. But she said, I have to tell you that that day, I was on my way to Connersville, Indiana. I was supposed to preach a service there. But when I was on 75 at the Dry Ridge exit, and that's just a very short distance from where Logan was killed, she said a burden fell on me. I felt death. I didn't know who it was, but I had to pull off the side of the road where I prayed for two hours. And then I had to go on. I had a commitment. She said, uh, ever since this is like six or seven weeks later that we're having this conversation. She said, ever since then I've been praying and saying, God, give me something for her. She said, at first the only thing I heard was the cycle of life. But she said, I kept praying. And she said, finally, the Lord spoke to me and said to call you and tell you, all is well. I don't know how, ladies, but God, I believe, uh, Logan is resting in the arms of Jesus tonight. And a good, and somehow, I believe God gave me that dream. So that I would know that somehow in the providence of God, it was all in his hand for this to happen. We don't understand, but I believe God in his grace and mercy wanted me to understand that. I have a good friend here who has helped me, Leanne, stand up. This is Pastor Leanne Pardon from Columbus, Ohio. She called and spoke to me more than one time during that that tragedy, but, you know, we were talking during that time. I've got to know that Logan made it. This woman's baby boy was 17 years old, and it was a case of mistaken identity, and a bunch of, of gang members chased him home in his car, and he drove up in the yard and, and jumped out of the car and was trying to get to the house, and they shot him in the back. Leanne said, Cindy, he lived for 30 seconds, 90 seconds. But she said, you know, you can say a whole lot to God in 90 seconds. Somebody needs to receive that this morning.
You don't know if your, your loved ones made it or not. Let me tell you, the grace of God is far reaching. You don't pray in vain. Your tears are important to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I have that comfort. I have that comfort tonight that my grandson rests rests with the Lord. Um, I'm, I'm going to share one more thing. Those are the tragedies with people. But on April the 22nd, 2007, I was working in Kenwood at an office at the time, and I was sitting in my cubicle. And my phone rang, and it was my husband. And he was crying. I couldn't understand him. But finally I heard him, and he said, Cindy, our house is burning down, and we're losing everything that we have. Took me 40 minutes to drive home. It was a five alarm fire. When I got there, my neighbor had saved me. I could get nowhere near the house, but my neighbor had come down and was motioning me, in, motioning me into someone's driveway. So I parked and I got out and I said, John, how bad is it? He said, Cindy, it's, it's pretty bad. So most all of my brothers and sisters left their jobs that day and came to my house to be with us. Every person on staff at this church, they brought the church van to see if they could salvage anything. Every one of them showed up at my house that day. Pastor Tom was out of town, but he called me. And he said, Cindy, go get the church credit card, and you go get whatever you need. Because we lost everything. We didn't have to do that. But just the fact that he called and and was that concerned about us meant the world to me. Nora Lee Trent, they took me, there was nothing we could do but let the house burn. So they sat me down, me and Kenny, on the patio of our neighbor's house, and we were just sitting there. And all of a sudden I looked up, and I saw that white-haired woman in her jean, jean skirt and her gym shoes, and her Ph.D. coming. And she was speaking in tongues all the way. And she came and she stood in front of me. And she said, Cindy, I know this looks really bad, but God is in this and he's going to bring something good out of it. You see, I had been praying because a heavy burden was on my heart. I felt like God was calling us into missions. And one Thursday I was praying in my house and I said, God, if this burden is from you, this is what I'm asking you to do. I want you to confirm it through my pastor. We're under his covering, so if this is you, you confirm it through him. That was on Thursday. On Sunday morning, we were sitting over here a couple of rows back and he was preaching, he was down here walking back and forth And all of a sudden, he came over to the side where we were sitting. And he pointed at me, and I'm like. And his eyes were that big. And he pointed his finger, and he said, you, I've got it on DVD. You have been called at this time in history to go to the world. And he said it two more times, and then he was like, you know how Pastor Tom is? What was that? And I didn't talk to him that morning, but we came back that night. And from the pulpit, he said, Sister Cindy, I don't know what that was, but it was God. After the service, we came up and I told him, you didn't know. But this is what I said to God in prayer on Thursday. And God, you see, my house doesn't, God doesn't do things just because. But I had been praying and saying, God... Well, my husband was saying, we can't go to the mission field. We have a mortgage. What is wrong with you? So I started praying, God, you're going to have to pay the mortgage off. Well, he did. He did. But let me tell you something. We talk about brokenness and the blessing. God gave me a house worth twice as much as my other house, and it's paid for. That's what God will do. I 
want old tradition to come to get ready to sing. You are not here by accident. It's time to lay the burden down. You've carried it far too long and it's too heavy for you. God is saying it's time. Pastor Tom preached it last night. Freedom. God wants to set his people free so that we can get this job done before the Lord comes back. Amen. The freedom of the Lord. Let's stand all over the building. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be prayerful, church. There are people here that are going to lay their brokenness down this morning. Hallelujah. It was such a lovely day. Hallelujah. Be prayerful, ladies. And the sun was shining bright. Hallelujah. The gentle winds were blowing my way. Not a storm cloud in sight. But then suddenly, without a warning, without a warning. the storm surrounded. This altar is open, ladies. Oh! 
The God that I serve is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Together with Pastor Tommy Bates, we connect others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those who need revival in their hearts, you help make a way for them to be awakened. For those who need to hear about the saving power of the cross, you open doors for the Holy Spirit to sweep into their lives. For those who need strength to continue in life, you help make it possible for them to know that Jesus will carry them through. When you sow your best gift or become a partner with Tommy Bates Ministries today, you join with us to advance God's plan and purpose in the lives of those around the world. To partner or contact Tommy Bates Ministries, visit TommyBates.com, write us at P.O. Box 30, Independence, Kentucky, 41051, or call 1-866-411-1032.